Good? Whoa. Look at, look at check one, two. Good morning. Press conferences, check one, two, one, two. You need me to talk? No, or are you good? Yep. How about you guys, cameras? Good. Hello. Hello. This morning I had uh, sausage, um, tomato, onion, three egg omelet. It was pretty good. Also had some potato chips. I'm not really talking loud. I mean, if I was excited because I just won a game, I'd probably be more like this. One, two, three. Just won a game. Yep. Good. All right, cameras, good. Give me a thumbs up. I can barely see you guys with the lights. Or don't. You good? Focus? All right, cool.
you're going to miss me next week. You're going you're gonna to like wonder where I am. We'll be starting at 135 with the uh, student athletes from Texas A&M. Uh, we'll have Admin Gilder, Tyler Davis, and Robert, Willi Robert Williams. And a reminder, the lock we'll follow that with 20 minutes with Coach Kennedy, and the Texas A&M locker room will be open from 135 to 215.
Okay, we welcome the student athletes from Texas A&M. We have from left to right, TJ Starks, who's a freshman, Admin Gilder, Jr., Tyler Davis, Jr., and Robert Williams to my immediate left, sophomore. We'll have about 20 minutes. The locker rooms are open now from 1.35 to 2.15. We ask you to raise your hand. Let us get the microphones that Carolyn and Davis are holding. Let us know who you are, who you're with, and please address your question to a specific student athlete. First question right here, second row. Gabe Bach with Tex Ags for Tyler and Admon. If you could just take us through the opportunity of going up against the defending champs, basically in their backyard, and the excitement for that. Uh, it's a blessing to be able to compete against such a good team, uh, such a great coach. Um, you know, this is what all the work is done for. You live for these opportunities, so uh, we're all excited and we're ready to play. Like Tyler said, it's a blessing to be playing against a winning organization. And so uh, each and every one of us are ready to play and so and just give it our best effort. To our left on the aisle. Roger Rubin from the Fieldhouse. This is a question for TJ. I don't know how much you expected that you would be playing during this season when it began, but can you tell us a little bit about like what you thought was going to happen and how it sort of evolved into you playing such an important role? Uh, at the beginning of the season, I knew I was going to uh, contribute to the team, but I didn't know that I was going to uh, take on a great, walk, great road the way I am right now. So I just put in a lot of work, and uh, I knew my time was going to come eventually. So I was really prepared for the moment. Joe Giglio from the News and Observer in Raleigh. Robert or Tyler, I don't know how much you know about Carolina, but they have a different lineup this year. They're not as big as they've been in previous years. How do you guys feel like you match up with them, and do you feel like you do have an advantage on the inside against them? Robert. Uh, yeah, we definitely feel like uh, we have an advantage, honestly, against anybody on the inside just because of what we do. But uh, Carolina is a different matchup. Uh, the bigs, uh, one through five, you know, start the point, uh, shoot. So it's going to be a difficult task for us. But uh, our coaches are put, uh, putting together a good scout, a uh, good game plan to help us beat them. Tyler. Yeah, I feel like we always have the advantage on the inside. Um, but their bigs are really talented. Uh, they play Pinson at the four, so it's going to be a it's going to be a different way to guard them. It's going to be tough to guard, but I feel like we have the versatility to guard in every position. Roger Rubin from the Fieldhouse uh, for Robert and Tyler. You guys have had a, a, a few different starting point guards during this season. Is having the point guard uh, changing? Does that force you guys to adjust, or do the point guards sort of play a particular style and a system? What, tell us about adjusting to different guys at the point. Tyler. Uh, we just we play to the system, but I mean, not every point guard is the same. Like TJ, he's a scoring point, but uh, you know, we play to his strengths, and he plays our strengths. Um, I think we do a good job of that. Robert? Uh, like Ty said, uh, TJ is TJ the scoring point guard. Um, and with that ability, he opens up a lot of stuff for the team, uh, other guards and us, so uh, we use it to our strength. Second row. Yeah, for, for Tyler and for TJ, TJ, if you could speak to the challenge of going up against Joel Berry. And then defensively, Tyler, if they've got May at the five, how difficult of a challenge that is? TJ. Uh, Joel Berry, he's a uh, senior guard, of course. Um, he has good experience, um, so I just have to come ready to play. I know he's going to give me a good challenge. We just have to uh, stay focused and stick to the game plan. Tyler. Yeah, Luke is really good. Um, I know what kind of player he is and what kind of mindset he has. He has that worker's mindset, so he's going to come at me hard, and just like he does everybody else um, from what I've seen. Um, it's going to be a fun matchup, but he's a great player. It's going to be a lot of fun having to guard him. Front row. The, the veterans for Carolina have played 12 games or 13 games, I guess, now in this tournament over the last three seasons. Uh, how do you guys combat that experience edge that they have, and how have you prepared for the tournament setting where you're getting ready for a game 48 hours after you had played another game against a team that you don't see regularly? Admon. 
Um, you know, we just uh, stick to coaches' plan. You know, uh, we try to play our uh, brand of basketball each and every game. And, um, you know, like we've seen last night on TV, it's anybody's game. So as long as we come out and play hard and play aggressive, it's uh, anybody's game. To our left. If I could, I'd like to go one each for TJ and Admon. Sure. TJ, when, when you got handed the keys to the car, what was that conversation like with Coach? I mean, you know, I, it probably wasn't something that you initially were expecting. Tell us about what that dialogue was like. Uh, he'd just tell me to uh, play my game, just do what I know how to do. He'd tell me to stay poised and uh, just control the game, control the tempo. And uh, he tell me that I don't play like a freshman, I don't act like a freshman, so he just tell me to be mature about the situation and handle it the right way. And uh, I feel like that's what I've been doing this whole time. And um, I just keep believing in him and he believing in me and we just gonna keep rolling. For Admon, uh, you know, after a couple of different people had played point guard, you know, TJ steps into the role and, and you guys end up being successful. How important was it that he was there to sort of step in there? If you don't have TJ, how do you think the arc of the season might have gone? Um, I know TJ is a hard worker. He's one of our hard workers. I say that each and every day. He's in the gym every day uh, before and after practice. And um, I guess, you know, if he wasn't there, I guess we know it's the next man's up. That's, that's how this uh, program is. And so um, I think everybody on this team has done a great job of uh, being ready to play. And so, um, like we said, we just go out there and do what we do. Middle of the room in the aisle. Sash Tyher with Carolina Blitz. Uh, guys, talk about it. I guess this is for Tyler or Robert. Uh, this is essentially a home game for Carolina. Talk about playing in this type of environment um, and do you think the fans going against you will kind of fuel you or work against you? Tyler. Uh, we've done pretty well um, on the road in, in neutral court games. So, um, and they're going to have a really good crowd. It's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of energy. But, uh, you know, we roll with what we got in the locker room. and We know it's going to be us out there battling against everybody. Robert? Uh, yeah, like Ty said, we know they're going to have a big crowd out there. but. Um, we know what we got, you know, we live for the moment. We played and uh, impact the way games, you know, we feel like it's nothing but fuel. We don't fear it at all, so. To our left. Uh, Brian Mull from the Fieldhouse. Uh, Admon, you touched on this a minute ago. What was it like for you as a basketball player, uh, even though they're in the opposite pod watching the UMBC game last night? Uh, we was watching at the hotel, and it was just amazing to see how, you know, um, uh, UMBC came and they played, they brought it to them. You know, they played hard, they played their brand of basketball, and that's like that's what we try to put our hats on, playing our brand of basketball, whoever we play. And so, you know, we have uh, great bigs, we have great guards who can play, uh, that can play different positions. So, um, just knowing that, seeing that, it just it gives, uh, it gives teams around the country knowing that it's anybody's game at any given night. Any other questions for the student athletes? Okay, guys, thank you. Good job. Reminder the oops, you're right. Reminder the Texas A&M locker room is open till two fifteen. Uh, Coach Kennedy will be here at one fifty five for twenty minutes with him.
excited to, to have advanced in the tournament. Uh, that's what it's all about. and makes you feel a big, a big part of it when you win a game and you can kind of follow the, how the tournament goes. And to play against a Carolina team here in Charlotte uh, is something that every coach and every player was, it would be looking forward to. So we're really excited to be playing against a really good team. You know we're going to have to play really well to get the win. Questions for Coach? Roger Rubin from the Fieldhouse. Coach, in terms of the arc of your season to arrive here, how much of that do you think had to do with the depth that you had at point guard on this roster this season? You know, I think we, we've, we've played a lot of different lineups. We've gone through a lot of different things. And I think just the experience of playing TJ Starks at the two earlier in the year, and he played back, he backed up the one against some really good preseason teams that we played. He's been in some different, he, he start, his first start was at Kansas. You know, I think it helped get him ready for this moment. And I think that that's a good point. I think that's one of the reasons why we're here today because he's been through some different things and our team has been some, through some different things. So we've weathered the storm and been pretty resilient through it. Just to follow up on that, yes, you did weather the storm. What was it like being the coach in the storm? <laughs> uh, it's, it, it's, it wasn't a, a dream situation, some of the things we went through. It's really one of my toughest years as a coach because we had such great expectations and started off so well. We started out 11 and one, fifth in the country, and rose up real fast. And we did it with a broken lineup even then. Robert Williams didn't play against West Virginia in the beginning of the year. We added him to the team in, in Brooklyn, and then we continued to win, and we continued to press on, and, and I thought we got better. And then we had the injuries. The injuries were, were, were the biggest problems. When you lose Dwayne Wilson, who's a, a, an older senior for us and experienced one of the true experienced guys that we had that's been in the NCAA tournament, that's played in the Big East, that's played a big time. We lost him. That was a big loss. And losing Admon Guild to the first, I think, four games of conference play is not when you want to lose a guy to injury. And he had to have knee surgery and came back. Um, it really muffled up our lineup, muffled up our rotations. And we started one group one way. And then next week, we started the older guys and it went back and forth. So. Hopefully that we survived it. It made us tougher. Our guys hung in there and they believed what we were telling them. And, and thankfully, we're in this position today. Second row to our right. Yeah, Gabe Bach with Texax. Billy, I came in a couple minutes late from your locker room, so I'm sorry if this is asked before. But just the challenge that Joel Berry presents your freshman point guard when North Carolina has the ball, but then also when they run May at the five, which they've been doing, the challenge that that presents defensively? No, no question. He's the most experienced, probably best point guard in Roy Williams' system in a long time. When you look at the games they've won and what he's done, I saw him in high school. He was a five-star player. He won a state championship. The kid's about winning. The kid does. He understands how Coach Williams wants to play. And uh, it will be a tough matchup. But TJ hasn't surprised me. There, there are no surprises with TJ. You know. He can make two great plays. He can make two plays that I'm pulling my hair out, you know. So I don't think there's anything that TJ's afraid of. That's the one thing we like about him. He, he doesn't lack any confidence, and that's a good guy to have in your, in your foxhole when you're going against Carolina in Charlotte to have somebody who's not afraid. And so uh, hopefully he won't get caught up in the, the transition game and we won't just run up and down with him because that's not something we want to do. We want to wait on our bigs. But it'll be a new experience for him. But I like our chances because of his confidence and what he's been through already. With Luke, Mike. with Luke May, that's a tough matchup for anybody, and uh, that's why they've won so many games because he's an experienced post guy who goes out on the floor and can push it on the break. Uh, I, I knew they were really good. I knew their personnel before I started watching them on tape. But as you watch them on tape. You see Theo Pinson pushing the ball in transition one minute. You see Luke May pushing the ball in transition the next play. And then back to Joel Berry. That's what get, makes him so good in transition. And 
Uh, you can prepare for it but in a short amount of time, but you don't know how good until you see it. Bash Ty Hurt with Carolina Blitz. Uh, Coach, we saw history last night. Uh, it's known that Carolina has never lost a game here in Charlotte. Is that something that you talk to your team about? You know, let's do something else. Let's make another, let's make more history here in Charlotte as you head into this well, game. That, that just motivates me a little bit more. I didn't know that, so that's good. We'll, we'll use that. We'll use that as motivation. We got, we're going to come in here loose and play. That's the thing. We're coming here. We're going to have the attitude. We're going to come in here and have fun and enjoy the experience, and we're here to win. We're not here to just show up. We've talked about this moment from the spring on last year. The Final Four is in San Antonio, and we don't want to just go there to eat chips and salsa. We want to go there to play. In, a, in, order, in order to play, you got to be able to beat Carolina or beat good teams that are in your way. And so uh, we'll, we'll use that as motivation. And we know it's a tough task because Coach Williams is a great coach, and Carolina is Carolina basketball. You just know it's going to be a challenge. Last row on the aisle. Coach, Brendan Marks, the Charlotte Observer, you mentioned the challenges that Joel Berry and Luke May present. What about this matchup gives you confidence? What, what are the things that you like before you go into this next game? Well, I, we've got five guys who can get you double figures any time also. Um, at the three, four, and five, our length and our size is something I don't think they've seen a whole lot of. It's been, uh, I thought, Providence Coach Cooley made an interesting comment that the, our length really, really bothered them. Until you go through it, until you see it, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's a tough experience. So hopefully our inside play and our size will be a factor and we'll, our guards will make shots. When our guards make shots and take care of the ball, we're hard to beat because Robert Williams and Tyler Davis are load in the post. Middle of the room to our left. Hi, Coach. Kira Luck of Black Sports Salon. Um, playing with motivation and playing with momentum is a great thing and a bad thing. How do you hone in that motivation into something great instead of it overwhelming your players into making mistakes to where it causes a problem? Well, again, you, you hope your preseason experience and the teams we played, you look at who we played against and playing at Kentucky and playing against a good Arizona team on the West Coast. Kansas, we've, we've, we've seen a lot of different things, and so you hope your experience prepares you for this moment. But you never know until you go through it. That's the one ad advantage Carolina has over probably anybody else they'll play all year, and, and they've had it all se season long as they've experienced a national championship and experienced this more so than any other team left playing. So if you're going to get past that, you gotta, it's good to play. It's, it's good as now is as, as good a time to go through it. On the aisle to our right. Coach, there's, uh, there's only a limited number of hours that you get to prepare for this game. Can you sort of give us an idea about how much of the time is spent focusing on the things that you guys have done and how much of it is taking a look at Carolina and what you can do to them? Well, we do transition defensive drills every day. So, I mean, we spend from the beginning of the year to this time of the year, even today we practice, we work on transition defense, that's an emphasis. Uh, but in the short amount of time, we got to watch them play the first 10 minutes here. And then uh, we went back to the hotel and not knocking Lipscomb, because uh, we know anybody can win, but we started watching Carolina right away. And um, the, the thing about Carolina, I've been watching them my whole life. so. That's, uh, I think we'll know more about them than they'll know about us. I hope that's an advantage. But, you know, you, you, get, you see them all the time. You don't see Texas A&M on t television every night. Uh, and, and hopefully you're starting to see us more and more. But it, it's, it, it is different. But you have all that. Yesterday, that's all I did. I was locked in my hotel room watching film, trying to get as, as familiar with their personnel as possible. Today, we'll go through it. We'll show film tonight. And then we'll just go play. But you got to hope that your body of work and practice throughout the season prepared you for this and not just this last day and a half. Other questions? <coughs> Second red or right? <coughs> yeah, Billy, I don't know if you heard Roy Williams' comments yesterday, but he called you one of his heroes because of what you've had to go through as a coach and through seven years and maintaining strength and overcoming a lot with your with your health situation, 
what did that mean to you when you heard that? Well, it's obviously special because I got so much respect for Coach Williams, and we've talked about it on the road some because he's had some health issues, and he knows some people that have had Parkinson's disease, and he understands that it's a challenge, and uh, he's really been supportive every time I see him. He, he, Roy is Roy. He's a special man. He's a special coach, and for him to say something like that, it's definitely touching and uh, encouraging. Other questions at all? Okay, thank you, Coach. All right, we'll see you thank tomorrow. you. Two twenty with uh, student athletes from North Carolina.
minutes away from starting with uh, North Carolina student athletes, Cameron Johnson, Kenny Williams, and Luke May. The locker room will open at 12 at 2:20, and it will close when we finish the um, the interview with Coach Williams.
So we'll be starting in about a minute with the student athletes from North Carolina. Here we go, and reminder, the North Carolina locker room is open. We'll be open until we finish with uh, Coach Williams around 3 or so. Uh, welcome the student athletes from the University of North Carolina. We have from left to right Cameron Johnson, in the middle Kenny Williams, and to my immediate left Luke May. We have about 20 minutes. Please raise your hand. Let us get the microphones which Carolyn and Davis are manning. Let us know who you are, who you're with, and please address your question to a specific student athlete. First question, middle of the room to our left. Kiara Luck of Black Sports Online. This question is for Luke. Um, when we spoke last year, you know, you were pretty low key, and this year is just totally different. Like, I know you can't say that you knew this was coming, but were you ever just sitting there like you just wait till I get lit and everyone just sees how good I really am? <laughs> um, did you just say lit? <laughs> uh, I thought I heard that correctly. Uh, I thought um, the biggest thing for me is just kind of being confidence. Um, Really uh, coming off of last year and my end of year meeting with coach, really just talked about continuing to play with confidence and knowing how good you can be. And he gave me the, all the confidence in the world and the coaching staff. And then just playing with my teammates and having just such a core group coming back, uh, I knew I had to uh, step up a little bit. And I feel like us as a group have stepped up our games and uh, really started to play well at the right time. And I think it's been uh, really beneficial to our success. To the left, middle of the room. Uh, this question is for Luke as well. Uh, Luke, you have a pretty daunting task coming into this game, going against those Texas A&M bigs. Can you talk about talk about that matchup, please? Yeah, I mean, I think they're they're both. I mean, all three of them that we've kind of scouted and looked at are both really skilled. They all do different things, and but I think we've had experience uh, going against Duke three times and having teams like Louisville and Miami who both present a, a strong front court, but. I think it'll be a great test for us. I think we'll be ready for the challenge. I mean, our bigs come off the bench, have played outstanding these past couple games, and they'll just continue to play their games and play to their strengths. It's going to be a big force. Back of the room, middle. Jen uh, Jennifer, your Associated Press. Luke, when you came out yesterday, you got the uh, cheer that's usually associated with Luke Keekley here. Um, th this is truly a home game for you. How many people do you have here? And do you, did you feel like the crowd was behind you specifically yesterday? Yeah, I think coming home is definitely a, a great feeling. I mean, I went home on Wednesday and Thursday to my house. I mean, it was great to see my brothers. Obviously, my one brother is playing baseball, so he's not at home. but. Just to be home, have that family feel, and uh, came out and didn't play as well as I would have liked, but all that matters is we won, and uh, you get another chance to play on Sunday, and uh, it's going to be a great, great game for us. Left middle. This question is for Kenny. What is going through your mind when you're shooting your threes? Like, when you're feeling it, like, I see the look on your face and how, like, you, you get your swag whenever you get in your groove. What's going through your mind at that time? Um... You know, once I hit once I hit one or two, uh, you know, I'm feeling pretty good, feeling pretty confident in my jump shot. And um, you know, if I get another one, it, I'm just thinking it's going in. Uh, you know, it's just 
you know, once I hit two, three, four, uh, yesterday I hit four, um, you know, at that point, I'm feeling it. Um, and I think everybody else knows I'm feeling it also. Uh, and I think they look for me a little bit more. But, you know, it's, it's, it's the same whether I miss two or make two. It's, it, I think it's going in. Carolina Blitz, uh, this question is for Cam Johnson. Um, you've been uh, played an integral role in this Carolina team, and this is your first NCAA tournament. Can you just talk about your experience, how you feel? <laughs> um, it's exciting. Um, we did play in the tournament at Pitt. That's why they're laughing. We, we played. <laughs> I, <laughs> it, first win, though. First yeah, win. Yeah, it's my first win. We'll go with that. Um, but it's exciting to be a part of this team with these guys. Um, I love going out there, you know, playing and competing with these guys by my side and, you know, wearing the North Carolina across my chest. And, you know, it's something that after, you know, the path I've taken to get here kind of means, you know, has a little bit extra special feeling to it. So it's something that I really embrace and just have fun doing. Again, to our left. I'm sorry, y'all got a lot of questions to get off. <laughs> what does it feel like being a UNC player playing at the House of Jordan? And knowing that UNC has never lost in Charlotte, you're playing in House Jordan with UNC across your chest. So what, what kind of feeling does that give you? Anyone can answer. Um, I mean, it's it's very special. I mean, playing in our home state. I mean, being from North Carolina, it's really cool to go out there and just hear the roars and the cheers from the crowd. I mean, I think the crowd plays a huge factor in every basketball game. And just being able to step out on that floor and uh, have a little bit of an extra advantage um, already and uh, just going out there and just playing the game of basketball that we all love. And in this great state is definitely something special for a hometown kid. Kenny? Um, you know, every time we put the jersey on, it's a, it's a sense of pride. Uh, and I think it's a little bit more when we play in, when we play in North Carolina uh, because we want to defend our state, really. So, um, you know, we just go out there and we're, we're excited. Um, you know, we ran out, you guys heard the, heard the crowd, heard the reaction. Uh, and that pumps us up a little bit more knowing that we have that many people in the crowd uh, with us. And, you know, like I said, that it's just that sense of pride when we put the jersey on. Cam? Yeah, I really agree. I think it gives us a, a good home feel. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of Carolina support in the crowd, and you can just see it all over when you look around. Um, and it, it really kind of picks us up, you know, helps us along. I really think a crowd can, can make an impact in the game, and, and it's pretty positive, you know, to have it in our home state, in the House of Jordan, like you said. Um, so, you know, just this stage means a lot. And to be close, closer to home, to, you know, play in a game with so much significance and, and so much, you know, familiarity is, is really special. Back of the room, last row. Uh, Brendan Marks, Charlotte Observer. This question's for all three of you guys. Uh, you know Virginia better than anyone. Played him in the last game before the tournament. Um, how surprised were you watching last night? Uh, what was that like for you guys? Did Coach say anything to you about that game? Kenny? Um, I was actually really surprised. Uh, you know, UMBC did a great job doing what they wanted to do, uh, driving and kicking and then they knocked down their shots. I think they were 50% from three, so um, they executed their game plan perfectly. And uh, you know, it was, it was just surprising to see Virginia uh, give up that many points on defense, honestly. Um, yeah, I would agree with Kenny. I felt like Virginia coming into the tournament was the hottest team out of anybody. And uh, I mean, obviously to lose Hunter was really huge for him. I mean, he's great on the defensive end, really makes a lot of key plays for him offensively. But uh, I mean, when you get to tournament time, everybody is, could be their last game. So I mean, you got to give everything you have, and UMBC just played better, and that's what it comes down to. Cam, yeah, um, it, it surprised me definitely, but I think UMBC just did a great job of you know attacking and, and scoring, and, and it was their night. They hit a lot of shots. Um, Virginia's definitely, you know, they're a great team. They proved that um, all throughout the year, and it's just crazy. It shows you anything can happen in March. Other question for the student athletes? Middle aisle. Are any of you familiar with any of the UMBC players for none of their names or anything in the junior ranks or anything? Um, Coach Odom was um, at Charlotte when I was going through the recruiting process and uh, 
He was an unbelievable uh, assistant coach. Him and Coach Major really came and watched me play a lot. And being from North Carolina, you really got to know him and the staff really well. And I was just so excited for him to have that opportunity to uh, really play on such a big stage and be successful was really cool to see. Cam or Kenny, you know, any connection? Um, Jerry's Lyles was at VCU uh, before he we went there. So, I mean, I didn't get to know him really well, but um, you know, I, I had spoken to him a couple times. Have this opportunity. You guys have this opportunity all the time, every year. Or you're expected to be on this stage. What do you think it means to those guys to first make the tournament and then pull off history? Uh, they they got to be on cloud nine right now. Um, to pull off something like that is pretty historic. Uh, they got to be, you know, riding high right now, feeling real good. Um, you know, they got another game coming up soon, so they can't fly too high, but. It, they, it's something that you got to enjoy, you know? Um, it, it, to win a game like that, to have a performance like that against a team that's, that's very, very good, you know, shows a lot about your team and your toughness. And I think the guys really stepped up to the occasion. So it's definitely something they got to enjoy. To our left. I guess this question is more so for Kenny and Luke. How are you soaking up these last moments with your seniors, especially Theo and Joel, um, enjoying these last couple of weeks that you have with them? Kenny. Um, I think on the court, just going out there and giving everything I can for them, um, you know, doing everything I can to make sure that they go out on a high note, uh, you know, controlling that uh, aspect on the court, and then, you know, just spending time with them off the court. Uh, you know, they're two great guys. They're, they're great to be around. So um, you want to spend time with those two, um, Joe and Theo specifically. You know, it's, it's easy to want to be around them because um, you know, you're always going to laugh. It's going to be a great time. So, um, you know, just, just living in the moment and just enjoying whatever time I have with them left. Luke? Yeah, I mean, I'm not really trying to think about it, honestly. Um, I can't imagine a team without Joel or Theo. I mean, they've meant so much to this program and so much to my uh, improvement and my success. I mean, Theo is the best teammate I've ever been around. I mean, he makes everybody better makes everybody laugh, and it makes practice so much lighter. <laughs> but uh, he just, both of them are just Joel's best worker I've ever been around. I mean, it's just really cool to have such great seniors who lead by example and vocally. Both each other are very different, but they get the best out of all of us, which is really important. Third row in the aisle. Yeah, Gabe Bach with Tech Sags. Cameron, as I recall, last year when you decided to transfer, A&M had pursued you. Could you take us back to that? How, how much did it come down to Carolina? Was A&M in the mix? And ultimately, why did you choose Carolina? Um, no, I never talked to A&M. Um, I talked to a couple other Texas schools. But you know, ultimately, I chose Carolina to, to be in a position like this, um, to have teammates like this, and to you know, be a part of something you know, that's pretty special and pretty big. Um, it took a long, you know, a lot of talking with my family and a long process to kind of figure it out. Um, and it was difficult at times, but I feel like, you know, I made a great decision coming here and I couldn't be happier. Any other questions? Okay, guys, thank you. Good job. You. See you tomorrow. Yeah. We'll start with Coach uh, Williams in about three minutes. Reminder, the North Carolina locker room is still open until we finish here with Coach Williams.
Okay, we're ready to start with Coach Williams. Yeah, he bogeyed two and birdied three, four, and six, and I just heard he bogeyed another one, so. And that shot that he hit on the par fives, I thought that was the right play before I left the room. Is that enough? <laughs> yeah. Second, uh, third row in the middle there. Hey, Roy, Dan Walken, USA Today. Um, you're in this tournament 30-something times. You figure at one point or another you're going to get popped in the first round. It's just simple math. Uh, you never have. When you see something like last night, how do you put into perspective for yourself mm -hmm. that not getting beat in the first round is, is one of your accomplishments in your career? Well, it's, uh, it, that was unbelievable. I'm telling you, it was, if I'm not mistaken, 21-21 at halftime, and we're going in to eat, and the second half is starting. and. I said, guys, I'm not, literally, and I'm not doing this anything against Ryan Odom. I love Dave. I almost went to work for Dave at one time. I said, I'm not watching this. I'm going back to my room, and I'm going to watch Texas A&M at Providence. There is no way that's going to happen. So we have beds over here. There's a phone, I mean, a TV, and then around the corner, we, I've got a nice room. Uh, around the corner, I'm watching in the Texas A&M Providence, and I go back, and I look, and I thought, good gosh. And then I go back, and then I go back and look. And I finally watched the last three or four minutes. But so that was unbelievable. And uh, um, we always try to just talk about playing one game, just one game. I've never spoken to our guys about, okay, we're a two seed and they're a 15 seed. I don't, I don't really think that I've ever said that to them. I said, the better we play, the better seed we get, the better chance we have of continuing. Last night I saw the thing up on the TV and, and I, I really try not to get caught up in any records or anything like that. But that's one I've been very proud of. I thank the team in the locker room. I say, hey, thanks, that's a pretty good streak. We kept it going. But, because uh, when I saw it up there at 28, yeah, 28 and 0 in the first round. And I know when we tied Coach Smith's record, I think his was 17 or something like that. So it's something I've been proud of. But other than that, I really don't get caught up in those record kind of things. I, I can tell you all five times I shot 69 and those kind of things. But uh, uh, so to answer the part of it about saying it to my team, I always try to prepare them. I did tell them this, that uh, I may miss the year 2002. We were in St. Louis. We were one. Holy Cross was a 16, and they had the lead with five or six minutes to play. And we came back and won. And in the next game, Kirk Heinrich had hurt his foot in the Holy Cross game, and he's sitting on the end of the bench with his leg up in the air in the ice, and I didn't know if he was going to play. And we got off to such a great start against Stanford. We had them 18-0. to zero. And uh, so I have been aware of it, and I've said some things, but never made a big deal of it except let's do everything we can, be as successful as we can, because when that big tournament starts, which is what we really aim for, uh, perhaps uh, – uh, will be a little easier to start. But that was un I'm, I was shocked. I kept thinking it's something April Fool's Day or something. I didn't know what the crap was going on. Back to aisle. Jennifer, your Associated Press. Um, you recruit kids that expect to be on this stage mm -hmm. and, and they are accustomed to playing and, and, and enjoying these moments. What do you think the UMBC kids are feeling right now and going through? And how, you know, as an educator and as a coach, how special is that, do you think, to, to see those kids have that one chance? Yeah, that's the beauty of the tournament. I mean, it's hard on coaches. One game, bad, and you're gone. But that's the beauty of the tournament and uh, to see those kind of things. And as I said, I've been there a couple times when it's been awfully close. But uh, you have to feel so good. I watched at the end. I have no idea what the guys were saying on TV because I had paid no attention to them. I was just watching the kids run around, and you know, it's called a hugger. You don't care how smelly or sweaty somebody is, they just run and hug each other. And seeing the people in the stands and the people they identified as uh, 
parents. I was really looking to see if they'd show Dave Odom because he has been a good friend for a long time, a North Carolina guy. Uh, but, and then the other thing is I was almost as stunned by the way Coach Odom handled himself. Guy, he was a daggum guy. I said, Jesus Christ, son, do you realize what just had the heck happened? I'd be running around acting a little crazy or something. But uh, I was really impressed with how he handled it. But the kids, and I've said many times, and, and I get corny at times, but that's a, the, the biggest thrill in coaching is seeing the looks on your kids' faces when they've accomplished something really important, and especially if it was really hard to do. And that's... You know, in, in basketball, that's that's Chaminade against Ralph Sampson. I can't even think of anything else that's close to that. So those UMBC kids, they had a tough time going to sleep last night, and so did Coach Odom too. I don't. He's had to. He had to go inside and scream or something. Third row, Roy Aaron Beard, AP. You said to this group, if they were going to play the small lineup, they had to rebound if you wanted if they wanted to stick with it. And you guys are second in the country in rebounding margin, maybe in a a little bit more unconventional fashion with how you guys go after it on the offensive glass. Did you think this group could ultimately rebound as well as they have? And does anything change when you're taking a, going up against a team with that much size? Well, I'm mad because we're number two. We were number one for a while, you know. So I got on them for losing that lead kind of thing. But uh, I, I've heard, Aaron, you've heard me before. I think it's the most critical factor in the game, the way we play. Now, maybe somebody else plays it different, or they can convince themselves, but. I knew that we would be a real good rebounding team because if they didn't rebound, they didn't box out, they weren't going to play. I'd find five guys that would. Uh, but also we emphasized it so much that they bought into it. It's been harder, you know, because Kennedy Meeks was naturally a great rebounder. Isaiah could go get him. Justin had three or four games where he was double digits. Rebound. Tony Bradley was a great rebounder. So the surprise of being able to do it at that level is, is there. Uh, but if we don't do it, we don't win is the way I look at it. Now you watch Texas A&M, and uh, they just, they're just maybe the biggest team I've ever looked at. And so we've got to try to do it at a higher level now than about anybody else that we've played. We've had three or four games where the other team out-rebounded us, uh, Duke's out-rebounded us, and they've got similar size like that. But A&M's got it through some of their perimeter players as well. So it's got to be the primary focus for us. But uh, I thought we'd be a good rebounding team, but perhaps at the level we are, maybe even surprise me. On the aisle to our right. Hey, Roy, Gabe Bach with Tex Ags. When you dive into the tape of A&M, how have they really changed since T.J. Starks really started handling the controls and coming into his own? You know, I, I, I'm, again, I never watched A&M tape until last night. And so I didn't see when – They've had two point guards that they started with, one hurt and one suspended. So I never saw them when they had those guys. I said in a press conference last night, I remember watching five or six minutes of their early game, the one that was, again, I keep saying it was outside the country. Was it Germany? Yeah. I remember, yeah, against West Virginia. I remember watching a little bit of that. And then I saw them play a little bit against Kentucky and a little bit against Kansas. And so until yesterday, I didn't have enough knowledge to even talk about it. But that's the way I do everybody. Normally, I will watch a game tape the night before we play someone. Now, with Lipscomb, is a little different. I knew Sunday that we were going. So I'd watch three full games on, on Memphis, I mean on Lipscomb. Well, uh, Brad Frederick had that team. He watched 12 games. Okay, Hubert Davis has got A&M by tomorrow when we play. He will have watched 10 or 12 games. So I'll get a more idea. But uh, I know Billy, and I said last night I can't have any more respect for anybody than I would him. And, and I'm not trying to act like we're bosom buddies. I mean, I always say hello, and, and I do. And when I heard about what was going on with him a few years back, I said something to him. But he's a fantastic guy, a fantastic coach. Who The focus that he has is just incredible to me. So. I've known a little bit more about them just because trying to see how he's doing. Front row. Mark Friedlander, North State Journal. Um, Roy, Sterling and, and uh, Garrison over the last two, three weeks have started playing a little bit more, getting more involved. Um, is that just a matter of freshmen developing and now being more confident ready? And how much are those two going to have to really contribute against that big Texas A&M team? You know, I'd like to say it's coaching, but I think it is just kids developing. And then, and, you know, 
two months ago, three months ago, whenever it was, I decided to go small, and then all of a sudden, later than that, I said, hey, wait a minute, I gotta try to do, help these kids be developed too, so we're gonna give them more opportunities. I'm not gonna forget them completely. And uh, so we're trying to give them more time. We're putting them in the game in difficult situations and expecting them to perform. If they don't perform, I chastise them. If they do perform, I pat them on the back, but we give them more chances. But what they've done so far has been, has been good. But now this is going to be maybe the biggest challenge they've had. I mean, it's similar to Duke because with Wendell and, and Marvin, the guys they play are that size. The difference is going to be the guys that Theo and Kenny Williams are going to guard. But uh, uh, they've got to come through for us. They've got to be big. Go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm I'm very lucky that they're not that kind of kids, but that's who I look for anyway. And I tell them, I, every kid I recruit, every kid. I didn't tell – Tyler Hansbro came to North Carolina thinking he was going to play behind Marvin Williams and Sean May. Every kid I recruit, I tell them it's going to be hard, and I am not a nice guy. I am going to be hard on you. I'm going to push you more than you've ever pushed. So that part of it I don't really get into. Second row right in front of you, Coach. Joe. Joe Gilio with the News and Observer. For all these years, teams have tried to solve your size. Is there anything you picked up from them that you can try to solve Texas A&M size? Uh, you know, teams have tried to spread us and, and, and milk a clock more is the way they've gone after us over the years. Um, <laughs> that doesn't really fit me. <laughs> I don't really think that I could do it. But uh, the other way they've done it is when we've driven the ball to basket, they blocked every shot. So we've tried to make sure that we stop a little short. But, no, their, their size is impressive. I just did an interview with uh, uh, Coach Thompson's group, and he said it may be the biggest group team that he's ever seen. And it really, when you look at how big they're, I mean, look, what, during, war, during the opening tip, look at the guy that Kenny's going to stand beside and the guy Theo's going to stand beside. I, their big guys are as big as some of the other big guys we're playing against, but their perimeter guys are a lot of size. So you got to get them off of you before you try to take an outside shot. So you got to take some, create some sp space with your dribble. You got to try to take them to the basket and go right out by them and not try to stretch it out because against a shot blocker, if you go do all this dipsy do stuff and stretch it out, you just give them space to find it and block it. Uh, we got to hope that we can get them in trial, foul trouble and get down to some of those other guys. Uh, but uh, they're here because they're really good, and uh, hopefully we're here because we're really good too. But uh, uh, it's – I didn't sleep really well last night, and it wasn't just because I was excited about us winning or stunned by Virginia. Uh, sort of watching that tape right before I went to bed, I have about enough time sleeping, and they added to it last night. But we are not going to spread it and hold it, though. I'll just give you a clue. <laughs> Phil Orton from WSOC uh, here in Charlotte. Luke said that when his shot's not falling, you stay on about remaining involved in the game in other ways. What is your message to him when you see maybe he doesn't have it? <laughs> you know, some things are not meant to be shared with everybody. I, mean, I chewed his butt out last night. I said, you're one of the best players in America. You're first team all ACC, third team all American. Just be Luke. Quit worrying about things. Just play basketball. But uh, sometimes I get a little more heated with him. And last night I kept him out a little bit because I wanted just to see if I could get him simmering over there a little bit. Uh, but he's he can't beat the world by himself. And I love kids who care. And Luke May really cares. And uh, I don't have to coach Luke very much. Just push him a little bit and with a little finger, and that's about it. Middle of the room to our right. Uh, Richard Kroon, Brian College Station Eagle. Coach, uh, you guys have had a lot of highlights. A&M hasn't had as many in the NCAAs. One of them, though, was beating North Carolina in 1980. I believe you were a student grad assistant or an assistant coach. Do you remember that game at all? Part-time assistant. Part-time assistant means full-time job, part-time pay. <laughs> I remember that so very well. So you remember well. that part. Do you remember, remember any of the game? I remember that very well. it give you a trivia question. Have you ever seen a game where you have the last shot to win the game? and lose by 17 or 19, because that was that game. Was it 17? So we had the last shot to win the game in regulation and missed it, and they beat us by 17. I remember that game, yes. Walked, walking out of the gym in Denton, Texas, and Eddie Fogler looked at me and says, we got to get to Albany, New York. There's a guy named Sam Perkins up there that we need to help us. Roger Rubin from the Fieldhouse. Roy, does, does Manley have an increased uh, role for tomorrow because of his size? 
Uh, not really. I mean, what I do is I put him in first or Garrison in first, and whoever plays the best the first time we get in there, they get a little more time. Last night I thought Sterling defensively would help us a little bit uh, against uh, Marbury because make it more difficult. But Garrison got in, had three assists, and did some good things. So uh, we went back with him first. So it's a go by the seat of the pants kind of thing. I've, uh, you know, I didn't like the way Sterling. It was a screen and roll, and I didn't like the way he got back to the roll guy. And so I took him out and put Garrison in. In the first play, Garrison did it well, and then. But when I put Sterling back in, he got like three rebounds in a row. So it, it's more of a seat of the pants kind of thing. Again to our left. Coach, Cam said yesterday, he had seven rebounds yesterday, but he said late in the game you pulled him one time because he didn't crash the boards. And he said maybe one of the biggest adjustments about playing for you is that constant mandate of never letting up. Even a guy like him, he's got seven boards, he's banged up, but he didn't do it one time when you pulled him out being a constant reminder. How has he handled uh, transitioning into uh, dealing with the mandate that you give these guys, regardless of what the circumstances are. Well, he's, he, you know, if he dealt with Jamie and he dealt with Kevin. Now he's dealt with me. He's dealt with three Stooges. Maybe I'm the worst of the three, but he's already done it. And he's in a demanding family. His dad has pushed him, and he pushes himself. But he's he's dealt with three different personalities in uh, four years because he redshirted one year. Uh, but. Uh, I'd already taken, uh, I think I'd taken Kenny out for that reason once as well. I just, I exposed and said it straightforward to, uh, to Cam about it. I took Cam out because he didn't go to the boards. Because in the first half, I was really ticked. Because Luke May shot the ball twice. And I got four guys standing outside the three-point line and not one daggum guy went to the board. And that happened twice. So I ripped all of them at that point. And I felt like that should be enough. And the one that I took Cam out was in the second half. But I'm not going to tell Luke May that you can't shoot because we don't have anybody rebound. Those other guys better get their butts up there and rebound also because Luke is our best percentage shooter from three and maybe our best from overall as well. But he, his doesn't go in all the time either. Somebody's got to go rebound it. And if I'm not mistaken, we were up rebounding wise like three or four in the first half. And I think we ended up being up by 19, 18 or 19. Middle of the room aisle. Yeah, Roy, uh, you know, the last couple of years you've been to the tournament, your program's been under scrutiny for things that happened off the court. Mm -hmm. Has life returned to normal this year? And especially given the context of all the other things going mm -hmm. on in college basketball, has that been nice for you that you haven't had to deal with that? It really year? has been. You know, for the last three or four years, I've been on record as saying the kids and my time on the basketball court with the kids has been. You know, I'm not trying to be too dramatic, but it's been my salvation. If I hadn't had those, I would have gotten out the door. But I felt like I needed to stay and see the thing through. I didn't feel like I had anything to do with it. But boy, those kids really made me feel good about being with them. And this fall, we had a uh, couple of guys visit who were top 10 or top 15 kids. We hadn't even been able to get those kids on campus for three or four years. So that felt better. There's no question about it. And and come into a press conference when I say, you know, guys, come on, let's please talk about the tournament and other people wanted to talk about the other stuff. It wasn't nearly as much fun. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's been more fun. This team has been sort of like the rest of them. They've really been a salvation for me, even though I've been having more fun anyway, so it hadn't been needed as much. But, uh, no, you're, you're exactly right. It's, I think you said pleasant. I think that's terminology used, and it's been more pleasant for me, yes. Last question, back left. Roy, we uh, got into your feelings on tights the other day in Chapel Hill, but um, do you have any rules on what now you're Wait a minute, there were a lot of other people around. Let's make sure you understand <laughs> we're going to talk about tights. It's not just me and you. <laughs> ah, well, uh, so do you have any rules as far as what your guys can wear as far as headbands, tights, any of that kind of stuff, or any feelings on that? Headbands went the way of uh, Gonzaga in 2000. Six in Madison Square Garden when I walk out on the court and I got five or six guys in headbands. We got beat. We stunk. And there's never been a headband and there will be another headband on a North Carolina player, period, the end. Shane Battier, if he wanted to come back and play, we'd talk about it, but we wouldn't wear a headband, okay? Uh, tights, I kid them all the time. Now all my coaches wear them out there. I told them I'm really going to surprise them one day. I'm going to walk out with some tights on and Theo just about puked right there. So... Um, you know, but it's crazy to me. You wear them on one leg and not on the other, you know, and I see that. And you wear it the next day, you may switch. 
I tell them I wouldn't mind wearing them because sometimes it's cold, but uh, no, that is honestly the full extent of our conversation of tights. Let's make sure we understand that. Guys, thank you very much.
Okay, here we go with Kansas State. We welcome the student athletes from Kansas State. We have from left to right Xavier Sneed, Barry Brown Jr., and Cam Stokes. We have uh, 20 minutes. The locker room is now open. We'll be open until we finish with Coach Weber. First question to our left, and please address the question to a specific student athlete. Okay. Uh, Tim Fitzgerald from GoPowerCat.com. Barry, you had a, you guys had a good four days of preparation, watching film for Creighton, and now you got to turn around on 24 hours and and take on a team that uh, just dismantled one of the best college defenses out there. What are your early thoughts on this, and how do you approach this? And Xavier, if you could uh, pipe in on this too, with getting ready for this game. Uh, well, I mean, they're, I mean, they're a great team. They, I mean, they share the ball uh, really well, especially uh, in transition. Got to kind of get it out. Got a, a lot of different guys that can bring the ball up. Um, so, uh, but. The quick turnaround is something we're, we're kind of used to. We, we had the Big 12 tournament. We've had games uh, during regular season where we had the one-day turnaround uh, or uh, play back-to-back days. So, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's nothing that we haven't seen before. Xavier. Is there any similarities in this team and someone you've seen in the Big 12? Uh, Definitely Oklahoma. Get up a lot of threes, get up a lot of threes quick, especially in transition. And they're a fast paced team, so I definitely say there's similarities to Oklahoma. First row right in front of us. Yeah. Uh, Cam, uh, Matt Hall, Case It Online. I'm curious if you guys, you specifically, could walk through the emotions of last night. You get that win, and you know you're moving on to the second round, and I'm sure it's a great celebration. And then at what point do you realize what's going on in that Virginia UMBC game and just what the evening was like for you guys? Uh, you know, we got back to the hotel, uh, talking with our family and everything, and, and then we turn and look at the TV, and Virginia losing. You know, um, I'm pretty sure nobody expected that, but you can't you can't look past UMBC. They're a real good team, uh, like Barry said, and they share the ball very well. Barry, um, w would you be expected to match up on Lyles? He's he's obviously played really well. He played well against Virginia. And, um, you know, he had the big shot in the uh, conference tournament to win that. You expect to be matched up against him, and have you watched tape on him? Uh, yeah, I mean, I watched tape on him uh, already uh, since last night uh, when I found out we were going to play him, because uh, that's going to be my matchup. I, that's, that's the guy I'm going to be guarding for probably most of the game, just trying to see where he picks his spots, what, what he likes to do, um, and uh, how he likes to score, how he likes to uh, help his team win. So um, I've been watching film on him since last night. And, uh, with the scouting report tonight, we're going to have. Uh, hopefully, I can shut them down. Second row to our right. David Smale, Topeka Capital Journal. For any of the three of you, the country's going to be rooting against you. They're going to be rooting for Cinderella. What's your mindset going in saying, hey, story, story time's over. This is basketball. Xavier? Uh, just come out here and play our game. Be focused and be prepared. And I feel like we can come out here and get the W. Barry? Um, I mean, we know that uh, everyone's kind of look, looking for that Cinderella story, and uh, we, we're just going to keep playing K-State basketball like we've been uh, all year, not, not worry about um, who they beat or, or what happened yesterday or two days ago or whatever. Uh, we're going to come out and play K-State basketball and uh, respect our opponent and, and play, play in hopes to win. Cam. Uh, you just can't look past UMBC, you know, uh, especially in the tournament, anything can happen. Um, so you just had to prepare for them and get ready for the game. Middle of the room. Uh, Blair Kirkhoff with the Kansas City Star. Cam, this is for you. You're a Baltimore guy. What, what did you know about this school, this program, growing up and coming out of high school? Uh, growing up, they recruited me. Um, I, I, know, I know some of the players that's there. Uh, I, everybody's seen that they play fast. Uh, I knew that. And... Um, you know, they're a real good team. They got some guys in this year that can do a lot of good things. Um, so we just got to be ready for that game tomorrow. 
Second row right. Cam, are you surprised by the contribution the last couple of games by Mike McGurl? Where does confidence come from? What, what do you expect from him moving forward? I'm not surprised at all. Uh, he showed that in the Big 12 tournament um, when he came in the game and, and made some good plays. And, uh, you know, he's, he's prepared for it the whole year. So uh, I'm not surprised at all. Front row to our left. Barry, um, they like to spread the floor, dribble, penetrate. Do you see any similarities in how they attack with their guards, attack the rim, kind of like what you guys do? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, they like to uh, get, get in the lane and kick a lot of rope action, just uh, trying to make the, the next defender help and um, trying to get wide open threes. I know they shoot a lot of threes. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big chunk of their offense and a big chunk of their points, um, game in and get, game out. So uh, we just have to uh, contain, play some good individual defense, uh, but still have our, our, our brothers back when, uh, when they get beat, have a hard, high closeouts, make them put it on the floor and not get those wide open threes. Third row. Uh, Cam, just curious, their point guard, uh, KJ, is, is 5'8", 140. You don't really see that too much at the Division One level, quite frankly. Um, what do you think about him as a player? Why is, why is he able to play with the big boys of Virginia? And would it be possible for you to post him up low, uh, given the size advantage? <laughs> I mean, uh, that's, that's all within our, our system, you know. Um, I'm, I'm going to make plays. Uh, we're still running the system. Um, he's a good player, you know. Uh, that's obviously why he's at the Division One level. And uh, you can't look past him, can't underestimate him. He's capable of a lot of things, and he works well with their team. Front row. Yeah, X, this is for you. I'm curious, how different is your role from the three to the four spot? Um, is it significantly different, and which one do you enjoy playing more? Interchangeable, really. Uh, I played the four a lot last year as well, and it's just it's, it's nothing really different for me. And like playing to different teams like this, they, that space out the floor is it's just a little bit easier for me. So I feel like uh, it, it's better for the matchups for us. Back right, Roger Rubin from the Fieldhouse. This is for Barry. Uh, forgive me if this was like one of the first questions because I arrived a little bit late, but I I think that nine seeds make it to the Sweet 16, maybe. 4% of the time. Uh, of course, usually there's a number one in the way. How do you guys look at this opportunity to maybe get into a sweet 16? I um, mean, it's, it's a big time opportunity for us. Um, but I mean, we still have a, a team in our way right now. We're not really looking towards a sweet 16 because we we, we have to worry about the, uh, the the 32 that we're in right now. Um, UNBC is in our way. And uh, all our focus, all, all our efforts and energy is, is, is on beating them. Other questions? Okay, guys, thank you. Good job. We'll see you tomorrow. Yep. Reminder the Kansas State locker room is open. We'll expect Coach Weber here around 3 30, and the locker room, locker room will remain open as long as he's up here.
Okay, we're about ready to start with Coach Weber. Take questions for Coach Weber. Raise your hand. First question, far right on the aisle. Oh, sorry, Coach. Um, Coach, just first your reaction. I mean, uh, I don't think anybody really expected to see what happened there with UMBC last night. And, you know, uh, I'm not sure if you guys were already scouting Virginia film or what was going on, but what was your reaction to what happened and your thoughts heading into Sunday? Well, obviously, it's history. It's never been done before. And, and, and not only, you know, when you think about the magnitude of it, how Virginia's year and how they dominated uh, what I guess, you know, we feel like we had a good conference, but obviously they, they had more teams in the NCAA tournament, and they won the league and won the tournament and, you know, played at such a high level. Obviously, they lost an important player, but uh, you think they'd be able to surprise, you know, be able to survive that. But, uh you know, they didn't, uh, the, you know, I told our guys that the, the best team on the court won. You know, they controlled the whole second half. And, uh, you know, I kind of beforehand, uh, you know, motivation stuff, you know, when we talked about our bracket, I said, well, I don't, Virginia's really not that good. And the coaches looked at me like I was crazy. So last night after, you know, all, it was kind of a neat situation. We were at NBC Suites and we had all our, our fans, family, our players, they're all kind of watching the game when we got back and, and, you know, lots of cheering and, and stuff. And um, I just made sure we got them together and make sure that uh, we understand how good they are. And, uh, you know, we, we got a big challenge in front of us tomorrow night. On the aisle, middle of the room. Yeah, Bruce, uh, Dan Wolken, USA Today. Uh, I don't know if the parallel is exact, but, you know, back in 2002, you know, nobody really knew who you were. You beat Texas Tech, Georgia in the tournament. How did that change your career? How did that change your life? And can you sort of sympathize with what Ryan has gone through the last 24 hours? Well, it's, you know, one, they got back really late. And, you know, so many things going through. I'm, I'm sure he did. I, I know one day I did 25 different interviews, radio stuff and different stuff. And it, and, you, and at that time, you, you just say hey, yes to everything. You know, you just you want some exposure for your program and, you know, you got you got to give him credit, and you know, but he's been around it. Obviously, I've known his dad forever. Uh, he's been around high-level basketball players, high-level players. He's been through the the tournament, and and I'm sure he'll handle it well. But it, it it is it is daunting. It and and when you do something like that, you know, every, everybody wants to talk to you and have a piece of you, and, and uh, you know, and and I told our guys, the most important thing for us, we got to be prepared. We can't worry who we play. We got to be worry, worried about our preparation. Front row. Yeah, Coach uh, Matt Hall, K State Online. You said a couple times this year about Mike being kind of the surprise of the summer. With that quote in mind, I'm curious about his recruiting process and then what that surprise was. What you didn't know about him when you got him on campus. Well, I think it was it was more. I asked the players who was the surprise. You know, I always say who worked the hardest. Kind of, you know, we always have our summer-ending meetings and. You know, go through some stuff, and you know who worked the hardest, who's made the most improvement, who's been the biggest surprise, and you know to the to the man, you know that every player said Mike McGurl was a surprise, and um, you know I guess they did. You know, part of it again is recruiting. They didn't know much about him. There wasn't as much hype. Uh, Coach Fraser kind of you know discovered him. We we watched him uh, that summer before his senior year. He had had some recruitment, but not not high level. He it picked up. He had a really good summer. It got better and better. We loved his explosion, his athleticism. Uh, he's got a little bit of cockiness to him, as you saw last night. And, uh, you know, he, 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 I just, as I've said before, I just have felt bad for him on his year, it, you know, from injuries to redshirting to not redshirting to, you know, not getting a lot of minutes that he wanted. And, you know, it, it's great for him to have the opportunity in Kansas game in here to, you know, show what he could do, and, and he rose up. He took advantage of the opportunity. We talk about that all the time. You never know when you're going to be called upon. you got to be ready to do it, and obviously he was last night. Front row to our left. Uh, GoPowerCat.com. A couple things, Coach. First of all, which of your assistants has the scout for this game? Uh, and with that, watching what they did offensively to a very good defensive team last night, what are the challenges in trying to slow down this team? Well, you know, it, it, the good thing is uh, we've faced some of the best 
offensive teams in the country, you know, from last night, Creighton, to the Kansas game, to TCU, to Oklahoma. And so we face some of those teams, so we're familiar. You know, it starts with transition defense. They're so good in transition. Uh, you know, last night they had four guys that could bring it up. You know, that, now it's probably more two guys or three that can bring the ball up, but those two are really good and, and, and cause havoc for you because they can get to the paint. They, they're good at flipping. They're, you know, flipping it back for threes. They, you know, put a, a lot of pressure on the defense. And I thought last night was one of our better things. Uh, we grinded out on offense and we played great transition defense. Now the little difference uh, maybe between these guys and Creighton they attack the paint on, on the closeouts. We're going to have to really do a good job of, of containing the, when they, we call it rope action or dribble action, uh, when they get in a paint kick and they got good three-point shooters. And, and again, we just faced, you know, TCU, Kansas, Creighton, three in a row that are three, of, and these guys are three of the, four of the top three-point shooting teams in the country. So did a good job last night. Uh, got to, you know, got to do it again tonight. But for the scout, we... You know, we, we divided it up on, um, on Sunday. Uh, uh, coach Korn and, and a coach took, you know, the, the first game, Creighton. Coach Razor was going to help with somebody. And I just said, Coach Lauer, you can kind of cover everybody, including UMBC. So uh, we had a little bit of stuff, but uh, we had to work hard last night. Uh, you know, I, I know I went probably 3 4 o'clock. I went to bed. Uh, they, I know they, when I, I left, they were still up working. I think a lot of them stayed 5, 6 in the morning. But we were ready for the players. When we got the breakfast, we had a clip tape. Um, you know, we were ready for them. We started going on personnel and, and making sure. And the one thing I did last night, at, and after we all, you know, they were all watching the game, I called them back to a meeting room. I had told them they could go to, to bed after, you know, meeting with their families and eating. And I called them back because I wanted to make sure they understood, you know, the tasks we had and how good they were. Second row to our right. David Smale, Topeka Capital Journal. I have a couple questions for you, Bruce. First of all, status of Dean Wade, and then I have a follow-up. And what else? I, I'll have another one. Oh, okay. Well, Dean, Dean did some stuff today again. Uh, you know, we just, you know, a little bit on the court. You know, just kind of see what happens. Again, I, I think it would, you know, if he plays, it would be a limited basis probably. And But, you know, you never know. Miracles happen, and, and uh, you know, it would be nice to have him. Obviously, we would have a nice matchup. Uh, advantage if we had him inside, but we don't. And you know, it's it's next man up. And Michael was it last night. Mac was it against Kansas. We got to have somebody else step up uh, tomorrow night. The follow-up question: Everybody in the country is going to be rooting against you, rooting for <laughs> Cinderella. How do you handle that? I mean, being the villain. I think we the coaches talked to the players about that. Uh, you know, last night about you know how they wrote history, and we actually had a little saying this week is. Uh, you know, the, the person who wins the war gets to write their own history. And, and so, you know, now we kind of, when they, they, they wrote their own history last night, now we've talked about us, you know, we, we're going to have to, that task, we have a battle. And, uh, you know, I, I was a little surprised at the game time, and I don't know all the logistics, how they decide that, but obviously, uh, you know, uh, prime time on Sunday night, they they put our game there, so you, like you said, I think a lot of people will be cheering for them. Middle aisle. Uh, yeah, opposite 60 minutes, I think. Uh, Bruce, this is a, <laughs> uh, Blair Kirkhoff for the Kansas City Star. Uh, Greg McDermott s suggested yesterday that not having Dean in the lineup kind of affected them. It helped, you know, changed you defensively and it affected them. And of course, you'd rather have Dean, but what are the, you know, are there some attributes to your defense when, when Dean's not on the floor in terms of? Perimeter defense. I think you saw it with Virginia last night. If you played two bigs against a team that's small, uh, you know, it's tough to match up. And they got him moving all around. And they do a great job moving the basketball, getting into the paint like we talked about. And, you know, and, and Dean still has been, and I've said many times, he's one of our better defenders and he's one of our smartest defenders. But w the one thing we had when we played Kansas, playing small ball, we, we could match up. Last night we could match up. And, and again, I think, uh, tomorrow night we can match up. It gives us a little bit of quickness. Uh, we actually put Cam on their four-man uh, yesterday because their four-man was really, you know, he's a perimeter guy, and, and he picked and popped a lot. And so, uh, so you know, in some ways, you know, we, we have better quickness. We have opportunities to switch things. 
uh, that we normally wouldn't if Dean was in there. But uh, I promise you, I'd, the players would love to have Dean back, and I know the coaches would. Third row. Coach, I wonder if you could address uh, UMBC's uh, backcourt with uh, Lyles and Mora. What, what, uh, what do you think of those two? And um, second part of that, with, with Mora, I mean, being 5'8", 140, and I may be oversimplifying the game, but why don't teams just uh, throw a point guard down there and back them down uh, on the low post? And would that be part of your strategy? Well, if you got a big enough point guard and you get mismatches, I suppose you can do that. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure in their league if you have big body guys that could do that. Um, you know, and, and last night, you know, Tony, they run their offense and they, they just kept running it and they didn't have that opportunity to do that. So if we get some mismatches, we might look at that. Uh, you know, but those two guards are very good. You know, they always say guards win in, in, in the tournament. And uh, Lyle's very similar to Marcus Foster. You know, it's, it, you know, a guy that can create. He scores in all three levels. He can jump up and make the three. He can get to the paint and shoot a pull-up. He can get to the hoop and make plays. And, and he'll, he'll get, he has some nice passes. I mean, that's the thing we showed our guys. If we overdo stuff, overdo our help on him, He'll make the right pass, and and Moore is just—he's one of those guys you hate to play against. You know, he he pestered the heck out of uh, out of Virginia, their point guards, and made it tough. They had them—they couldn't run their offense in comfort zones because they they that first pass was way out on the court, and and so the good thing with us, hopefully, we have three different ball handlers the way with our lineup now. So I said this is not an ego thing; this is a smart thing. Whoever he's guarding, get down the court. And let somebody else bring the ball up. So we'll we'll have to deal with that. But he is so clever. Um, he can score. He's a great uh, distributor. Uh, he, he he creates and you know gets in the paint and causes problems. He's definitely a little pest that you got to deal with. Hey Bruce, Vahe Gregorian, Kansas City Star. If I understood you correctly, you said earlier in the week as kind of a motivational point with the team. You told them Virginia's not that good. <laughs> and and then but then last night you're calling the team back in after Virginia loses. How, how was that? tinkered with or does it tinker in any way with just motivation psychology how, how you have I to actually told this? them when I, I said it last night I'm pretty smart I told you Virginia's not very good so I, I just played off of it and they you know they I'm not sure all of them got it but uh, but they you know that I just you know you're looking for things I was staying up uh, Sunday night after the pairings and they had George Mason and all the Cinderella VCU and they and they talked about a lot of psychological things they did beforehand and you know just kind of prepping them you know and and I said we got to focus on Creighton if we don't beat Creighton you know it does it doesn't do any good but uh you know we you know if we get there I I just say I don't think they're that good you know and I'm the coaches are like throwing things at me and stuff but I was you know you just kind of play with their minds a little bit and then last night I did again hey they're not that good but this other team is really good so we got to be ready for them second row to our right Coach, I imagine Barry is going to have the assignment of stopping Lyles. What, what do you see in that? Is he is he close enough to Foster that you think Barry can do a good job? What, what's your expectation of that matchup? I, I think he, they're like I said, they are very similar. Uh, they you know the older guards that know how to create and you know they got that step up, step back three. They can get in the paint. They use uh, you know ISOs for him. Um, you know he's good in transition. Uh, you know so it's a. Uh, you know, it's, it's similar. You know, Barry stayed up last night. He wanted to watch tape. We sent him some synergy stuff. We want him to go to bed, but, you know, he loves it. So he, and then this morning he put a little time in uh, watching again. Uh, and, that, and that's why we've been successful is that our guys prepare and they care and, and want to do a good job. Now, hopefully they're all cut in. You know, that'll, that'll be the big thing. You know, we had great team defense last night. Barry was big time. You know, Xavier was big time on Thomas, but uh, they had a lot of help from a lot of guys. Other questions for Coach? Back right. Hey, Coach George Willis, uh, New York Post. What does it say overall that uh, it actually happened that a 16th seed is beating a number one? Is the parity just gotten that much better, and why? Uh, I, I think there's no doubt the parity. And somebody brought up my Southern Illinois team, and and that you know I think since that time, you know the early 2000s, uh, you know. Every everybody's jumped up, and you know some of it. You could say the one and dones. You're losing young, some of the top kids. 
um, you know, early that aren't getting that opportunity to play. Uh, older players win. They got older guys, you know, and they and they got athleticism and quickness, and they got great guards. Everybody, I said it before, you know, it's always been said guards win in the tournament and make the plays. So uh, when you have experience, you got older guards, you got guards that can make plays. It gives you a chance, and you know, but it had to be the right story I think obviously it doesn't happen it's the first time and I'm whatever it is 300 some games uh, it had to be the right story Virginia loses somebody uh, the matchups you know and again you talk about you know when you get in a tournament how are your matchups and um, you know they were it, it you know there's no doubt there's more and more parity in college basketball you see Buffalo Arizona whatever there's always Loyola you know, winning the other day. So it's, you know, it's the fun. It's what makes March Madness special. Standing back right. Hey, Bruce, their point guard, I would assume, would be the smallest player in the Big 12, at least in terms of height. Um, did, did you scout that in any way? Did you prepare the guys for that size? Uh, you know, it's, it's, I said before, it's, it's kind of a, you know, it's that little pest. You know, you, the guy you go on the playground, you hate to play against because he's everywhere and he, and he makes plays and he, you know, he'll steal a ball off you. He'll, you know, he'll drive you, flip it back over his shoulder for a three. Uh, he just does a lot of different things. So we, we, we said you, you, got, you look at him, you know, that you got you to gotta respect him because he can play. And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a key matchup for us tomorrow, um, you know, how we deal with him. And obviously, Lyles is really good, but uh, Moore definitely creates for everybody else and makes them go. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Scheduled to start with UMBC at 355. We'll start at 355.
Okay, we're about ready to start with the um, student athletes from UMBC. Okay, we welcome the student athletes from UMBC. We have from left to right, Joe Sherburn, Jr., Jairus Lyles, a senior, and to my immediate left, KJ Mora. We'll have 20 minutes. Raise your hand. Let's get the hand, the mics to you. Let us know who you are, who you're with, and please um, address the questions to a specific student athlete. First question, third row. Gentlemen, um, how was the party? What did you do last night <laughs> um, after, uh, after that victory? KJ. Um, we got back to the hotel and all our fans was waiting in the lobby. It was like a great feeling. And then after that, our coaches encouraged us to go back to the room. And I couldn't sleep. I, I was up like till five in the morning. Jairus. Yeah, like KJ said, our fans and our families were waiting for us as soon as we got back to the hotel. So we, sh we shared a little moment with them. Uh, but then our coaches uh, told us to go upstairs and get some rest. So we, we tried to go to sleep, but uh, I don't think anybody on the team really got to sleep until about 4 a.m. The exact same answer. <laughs> Second row. David Smale, Topeka Capital Journal. Uh, is it, with that in mind, is there any chance of a letdown? Have you achieved your goal at this point? Are you, you know, satisfied, or is there a chance for a letdown? Joe? Of course not. We want to win every game we're playing, and we think we have just as good a chance at winning this game as last game and the game before that. Jairus? Yeah, like Joe said, we don't we don't really uh, want to get too high on ourselves. We know we just made history, but we're trying to like I encourage my teammates to try to block out everything because you know, we got a tough team. We got to play on Sunday, uh, so we're, we're we're preparing for that right now, and um, I think we'll be ready. KJ. Uh, yeah, we're not satisfied. Um, we going tomorrow with the mentality we're gonna win another game. Um, and yeah, uh, we we never satisfied. We hungry for more. To our left. Wyatt Thompson with the Kansas State Radio Network. Jairus, this would be for you, if you don't mind. I'm, I'm, I'm curious how much you have looked at Kansas State, what your initial thoughts are of their team. Um, well, I haven't really, we haven't really watched film on them yet. Our coaching staff has. Uh, we, saw, we saw them playing yesterday a little bit for about three minutes. Um, they're pretty big. I know their guards like to attack the rim. Um, so we'll, we'll get back to the hotel tonight. We'll watch film, and uh, I'll probably go back to my room and watch more film when I'm by myself and get prepared for tomorrow. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask one more. I got to see you guys play for the first time last night. Do you play like that all the time? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> back of the room. Jenna Fryer, Associated Press. I have two different questions. My first question is, you guys just got a new arena on February 3rd, 5,000 seats. It was a really big deal for you guys. So what is that like? And then getting out here on the Hornets arena against the number one seed. I mean, w is it a totally different world? KJ. Um, I think it got us a little, a little, little bit prepared because it definitely is not compared to all this. Um, but uh, it was a great experience for us to have th that new arena and feel the environment we needed to feel coming up to March. But yeah, this is a whole different world to me. Jarvis. Um, I think um, playing Arizona in the beginning of the year, they got a really big arena, kind of prepared us, playing SMU, um, going to Maryland and play. So I think uh, we were kind of prepared coming into this. And uh, most of our team has been in big games like this. So it wasn't really um, that new to us. Joe? I think the new arena helped us a lot just because of the adjusting to the shooting background. When we came, uh, we came into that arena, it was a big background with seats or a big, big giant wall when we come in from our small field house. So it helped us get used to shooting in big open spaces. Follow up. Uh, completely on 
related. Um, most of the guys that come through this room, they've prepared for this moment. They, they've been on this stage before. This is your guys' first time on this stage. Uh, you're now America's sweethearts. This is your party. So what, will e what do each of you want America to know about you? How did you get to this school? Do you guys play chess, Fortnite? Like, what, tell us about you guys. Joe. Uh, we are the Chesapeake Bay Retrievers. Not the Golden Retrievers. I saw that on SportsCenter. They had that. And uh, so, yeah, that's the state dog of Maryland. And that's what you should know. <laughs> what should you know about me? Um, after I hit my first three to second half, I, I did a big championship belt for Aaron Rodgers because uh, I'm his biggest fan and I wanted him to see it on TV. <laughs> but they didn't get the shot. I was just out of frame. But if anybody knows him, I've been trying to tag him. Our, our account was trying to do it too. All right, you, you, you talk to her. <laughs> Jarris. Um, one thing to know about us, I think uh, everybody on our team could probably have a job at comedian, being a comedian. <laughs> if, if basketball failed, uh, we're a really funny team. <laughs> so that's all I got right now. Hey, Jack? Um, yeah, I think we're probably the funniest team in the country. Uh, we top 10 for sure. Uh, um, but I always have a smile on me. If you see me in the court, I'm always smiling. Um, I think that comes from where I'm from, from Puerto Rico. Uh, and I really play for them. I play for my guys, but I just want to make everybody proud. Third row to our right. Uh, KJ, wonder, uh, you know, when you see guys listed and you see their heights and weights, it's usually a little fabricated. You know, six, two guys suddenly become 6'4", and you're listed as 5'8", 140. Are you that or even smaller than that? Just curious. Coach Weber um, just referred to you as uh, affectionately, I guess, uh, a little pest that he would never want to play in a <laughs> playground because he's, you're the type of guy to be stealing the ball away from you. Um, tell me about your style of play and, and if you could answer the first question as well. Uh, well, um, I'm 5'8 on a good day, uh, but you can, I'm 5'7 most of the times. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, I took a lot of notes on. Uh, short players like Muxy Bugs, you know, J.J. Barrea, one of my heroes, of course. Um, but yeah, I, I had to play like that. If I want to be success, successful in the court, I got to be a pest. I got to uh, bother the ball and make them uncomfortable. Uh, I think my size is an, uh, an advantage because uh, a lot of guys are taller than me and they don't expect me to be pressuring the ball at, uh, at that high level. So um, I think I use my size as an, as an advantage. First row to our left. For each of the guys, Vahe Gregorian, Kansas City Star. I wonder if each of you could just sort of describe the thing or things that have stood out to you, and just in terms of the reaction, what, what, what it seems to mean to people, um, whether it's your fans or even, even nationally, media, social media. KJ. Um, I think this is uh, the biggest win in school history. Uh, our president went to the locker room and said it's the biggest moment in school history. So. Uh, I think uh, this is a very special moment for the country and for our school, most likely. Um, yeah, like KJ said, it's a, a very special moment for UMBC, um, our team, our coaches, staff, the players, our family. So um, we're just trying to soak it all in right now. Joe. What stuck out to me the most is um, like my friends who are telling me back home in Wisconsin, they have entire bars rooting for UMBC, entire, entire houses rooting for us. and. Nobody believes them when, they, when they're wearing my UMBC practice jersey that they know me or that they have a connection to the school. So I think for now people, I never heard of UMBC before I came here. Nobody in Wisconsin knows what it is. So now everybody knows, I hope. You, you were very specific about the uh, Chesapeake Bay Retriever. What distinguishes the Chesapeake Bay Retriever's behavior? What, what, what is it that stands out about, uh, about that as opposed to the golden? Um, they're a dark brown. They have a thick waterproof coat of fur, <laughs> and um, I'm not sure about what else. Second row to our right. Last night, Coach Bennett said that your four guard lineup really messed with them. Kansas State plays a four guard lineup. How do you see that matchup? Any of you? Um, uh, I think it's a it's a hard matchup for us, but. Uh, I think um, we're gonna use our sizes, manage a little bit um, in the three guard in the in the four position. Um, we're gonna run our stuff, and it's gonna be a fun matchup. Second row. 
for Jairus, Gene Wong with the Washington Post. After you guys knocked off Virginia, Virginia Tech's out. No other DC teams have made the NCAA tournament. You guys are the last mm -hmm. from the DMV standing. For you, as someone who went to high school at Matha, how much does that mean to you to kind of carry the mantle of that going forward? Uh, it means a lot. Um, just to put on for the city of Maryland. Um, I know everybody on the team is not from Maryland, but we have a lot of guys from the area, so it's, it's, it means a lot. We've, we've been getting text, uh, social media posts, of just people people we don't even know from Maryland just saying how excited they are for us, how they're rooting for us, so it's very special. Back of the room. Hey guys, right here. Brendan Marks, Charlotte Observer. I know you said you're trying to block everything out and not let the moment get too much for you, but how do you actually do that? How do you stay so, you all seem really calm and composed right now considering how historic last night was. Joe. Well, luckily for some people like KJ, they're getting so many notifications that their phone doesn't work. So that's a good thing, I guess. KJ? Uh, like Joe said, my, my phone is not working, so I put that past me already. Follow up? What happened to your phone? Um, yeah, I'm getting so many notifications that my phone froze, and it, do, it does that every time I open an application, so I, I just can text. Front row? For any of you, Tim Fitzgerald, GoPowerCat.com. Um, Last night, you took apart one of the best defenses in college basketball. Uh, and tomorrow night, you'll face another team that likes to play really good defense, takes a lot of pride in it. What exactly did you do to Virginia? Uh, and when it, w at what point in the game did you know, these guys can't stop us? Jairus. Um, I think it started on that defensive end for us. We pressured their guards a lot. We didn't give them many open looks. Um, we made their bigs work, and they got frustrated. And it, uh, it helped us on our offensive end because they, they kind of got distracted, uh, got inside themselves. They're not hitting shots. They're not running their offense like they, use, they usually do. So it, they, they, they had defensive breakdowns, and we, we kind of took advantage of that. Um, I think we, we studied them well. Our preparation was uh, the best we had all year. Um, we, had, we had good tips to what to do on offense against their defense. And uh, Jarris even sent us a video uh, the night before the game about how, how to beat Virginia, how, what we got to do against their defense. And I think we have the guards to beat uh, almost everybody off the dribble and create a uh, place for our teammates. Joe. I think once we started hitting threes, um, we were able to get inside past them even more and then kick it right back out for three again. So we knew we were going to have to make a lot of threes, and we did that. We were 12 for 24, I think, so that was really huge. Third row to our right. Yeah, Jairus, uh, for, for those of us who don't know your complete background story, but um, you have graduated, correct? Mm -hmm. And um, did you have chances to go other places to play? And I guess you have a relationship, pretty close relationship with the president. I wonder if you can take us through, you know, why you ended up staying there, and who else was interested in you, and why did you stay at UMBC? Uh, well, I won't, I won't get into too much of who, who else was interested in me, but um, I kind of made a quick decision of uh, staying at UMBC. It wasn't really a decision for me. I knew I was going to stay there all along. Um, this is my family. I created a legacy here. So I knew we could do things like this. So this is one of the reasons I came back. And um, I have a great relationship with our president. Um, last year, uh, I got to spend a day with him. The first time I met him, I, I got to spend a, one of the, like a whole day with him. So it was, it was very special to see how he operates on the campus. Um, just just follow him around. So. Where did you like about him? Did you hmm. like about him? Oh, how authentic he was. Um, he was honest with me. We got to talk about more than basketball. We weren't just talking about basketball. We talked about life after basketball, his story, my story. So we kind of connected real real quick. Back of the room. My question's for all three of you. Um, so many teams come through here and they say, we just have to be better for 40 minutes and you know we can win this and nobody really believes them. Uh, um, you guys believe that you could do this and you're, you, know, you are only here because of a late basket in your conference championship. What makes all three of you and your whole team believe that you can and will win? Joe. I don't know, yeah, go ahead. I think the, the trust we got in each other is what gives us that little boost. Um, we play for 40 minutes or to hit a game winning basket like Jarris did. Um, we trust each other so much that Coach called a play against Vermont, and we, me and Jarris waved him off, and we said, like, we got this. Like, we know what to do. <laughs> so um, I think, yeah, the, the confidence we got in, in each other and the trust is the, is the key for our success right now. Jarris? 
Yeah, um, like KJ said, we're very connected as a team. Um, we're very close with our coaching staff, the players on and off the court, very close. So we just trust each other. Um, every decision we make on the court, we, we're encouraging guys to shoot the ball like we, we don't really ever want him to pass when he gets it. So uh, we're just we're just very connected as a team. Reminder, the UMBC locker room is open. It'll be open until about 4.30. Last question. Back back to the room. Vash Ty here with Carolina Blitz. Uh, this is for Jerry or, or KJ. Uh, I was talking with one of your assistant coaches outside, and he, I was talking about your head coach, Coach Odom, and he said he's very even keel um, and how as you guys were going on that run, his kind of demeanor, calm demeanor, helps keep you guys calm. Can you talk about him and, and that and going into this game and how he's helping you guys manage kind of the emotion and, and the gravity, the, how big this moment is for you all? Jairus. Uh, well, it's, he has a, uh, <laughs> a, a great role model in his dad who coached at the biggest stage on this level. Um, so uh, he does a great job of uh, bringing to, to us what his dad brought to him. So it's, you know, he keeps us even killed. Um, we keep him even killed. He never really gets too, too angry with us. He doesn't really yell at us like that. He's a player's coach, so we kind of uh, like that as a player. KJ? Um, I think he brings a, a winning mentality to our team. Uh, he, since he touched campus, he, he told us we're not underdogs. We step in the court to win a game. And even when we was up like 16, 14, like with four minutes left, he kept us on track. He like, don't get too confident, like finish the game the right way. Who has the next question? Yeah, back to the room. The call against Vermont that you guys waved off, it wasn't the game winning shot, was it? It, okay, so <laughs> what was the call? Tell, you guys just waved it off and you two just knew what to do? Well, he looked at me and said, run, uh, I can't say the play, but he said, run a handoff play. And we was like, no, we want to isolate Jairus and let him let him take him. And then he called another play and we also said, no, uh, Joe, go back to the paint. We don't want no screen. We just want Jairus 101 because we know he's going to take the shot and he was going to make it. Other other, yeah. Other questions? Okay, guys, thank you. Good job. Okay, we'll start with Coach Odom at 4.15. It's about three or four minutes, and the locker room's still open.
Okay, we'll start. It's about a minute early. We'll start with Coach Odom. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just take questions. Um. <laughs> First question, middle of the room, on the aisle. Ryan, Dan Walken, USA Today. Uh, your dad outside said that when you started your coaching career, he did not want to put you on his coaching staff, wanted to sort of let you find your own way. Uh, what were sort of the good things and the bad things for you about that path, and, and what impact do you think it might have had on you know, where you are now? Yeah, I think the only negative I would say is that just we didn't have that experience together, father and son, you know, coaching together. I think that's that could be, a, and it has been for others, a special, special thing. Um, but, you know, I think it was best for me, you know, without a doubt. And dad, you know, you know how it is. You, your dad knows best. And, uh, you know, for me, it allowed me to experience basketball. It allowed me to experience uh, you know, coaching under other great coaches, and I've worked for some great coaches along the way, and you know, to to you know, gain new experience um, and new ideas, uh, new styles, um, which is has helped me, you know, in, in this moment right now for sure. Second row to our right, David Smale, Topeka Capital Journal. <clears throat> Players said that. They didn't get to sleep till five or six o'clock, and that's certainly understandable. How concerned are you that there will be a letdown, that maybe they've accomplished everything and that they'll be let down against Kansas State? Yeah, I mean, it's always a concern. I mean, this is a historic event, and, uh, you know, our guys, you know, we knew that would be an issue. Um, I'm not the type of guy that's going to take their phone. That's just not how I do things. Um, that's more about, you know, th they've got to, you know, do the right thing, learn how to do the right thing. And, uh, you know, for us, you know, we experienced this on a much smaller scale when Jarris hit the shot at Vermont. You know, there was a ton of, you know, uh, focus, you know, on us at that point that we weren't really used to. Um, you know, mostly within the UMBC community, greater Baltimore area, you know, um, everybody was excited about, you know, going to the dance. Uh, now this is a little bit different story here. Um, you know, so we've got to encourage our guys, and we already have, you know, to, to kind of turn the page, and, you know, we've got to focus here. It's, you know, the biggest thing is, is you know, uh, are, do you want to be done now, or, or do you want to, you know, try to put your best foot forward and continue on? Because we're playing an excellent team, all right, that easily could dismantle us, and we've got to do a great job of focusing, just like we have every other game that we've played this season, all right, to put our best foot forward to have a chance. First row to our left. Ryan Vahe, Gregorian, Kansas City Star. This is really oversimplification, but do you have a little sense of being America's team right now and, and just the idea of the country getting behind this? Yeah, I mean, when you, you see Sports Center and they're talking about other events, you know, and comparing, you know, the game yesterday to other historic events in sports, I mean, it's, it's pretty special. It really is. And uh, we certainly understand that. I want our guys to soak that in, you know, without a doubt. Um, but there are two sides to it, too, for me. I mean, it's, a, it's obviously a bittersweet, you know, moment because I have so, so much respect for Tony Bennett, his staff, his team. Um, you, know, I, uh, you know, we've got this major emotional high, and obviously, you know, they've got this emotional low, you know, at this point, and there's two, two different things going on, and it's life. You know, it is. It's life. I did want to ask you about Tony. He, he was so gracious after, you know, really a rotten situation for him last night. I just wonder if you could elaborate on your sense of him and your appreciation of, of how he handled it. Yeah, I mean, to me, he's the best coach in the country. Um, you know, he, he's, he's a great father figure, great mentor to his, his team, not only his players, but his staff. Uh, you know, he's a great representative of the university and college basketball in general. Uh, I said it before we played them. I mean, they're what, you know, college basketball should be all about. And they have high character kids. They have great students. All right. They compete, you know, to the bitter end in every game. And, and you know, they don't pat themselves on the back, you know, after they get a win and, and they do special things. Um, you know, they understand that, you know, they're in this, you know, situation for a reason and, and, uh, 
you know, it's, it's, there should be a lot of programs, you know, modeling themselves, you know, after what he's been able to do. Fourth row to our right. Hey, Ryan, Phil Orban from WSOC in Charlotte. Obviously, a few years ago, you were put in a difficult situation here, taking over for Allen. What did you learn from that experience? And then kind of looking back on it, obviously, I would imagine there was disappointment in how it ended, but how would you characterize what you learned and, and where you went from here? Yeah, I mean, you, just to be ready at all times, you know, there, there's going to be, life's going to throw you some things, you know, um, you know that you have to, to adjust to. And uh, certainly that was a situation where our, our primary concern was Alan's health. And, uh, you know, thankfully he's, he's good to go now. And, uh, you know, I spoke to him prior to the, you know, NCAA tournament and uh, he's doing really well. Um, but, I mean, what did I learn most is faith. You know, that's what I learned most, you know, during that time. Um, you know, that was a dark moment, you know, certainly for me and others. And, uh, you know, if you don't have faith, you're not gonna be able to get through it. If you don't have your family, you know, to help you through those tough times, um, you know, you're, you're not going to get through it. And uh, I'm fortunate that I have both. And, uh, you know, the good Lord, you know, looked out for, for me and my family. My son was sick at the time. And uh, so we had, a, we had a lot of stuff going on. And, uh, you know, to, to be sitting in this situation right now, I mean, it's a blessing. I mean, it's not me. It's a blessing. First row to our left. Coach Tim Fitzgerald, GoPowerCat.com. You played a team last night that prides itself in defense, and you're going to run into that again tomorrow night. Give me how these two teams uh, are similar defensively and how, the, how much they are differently, do things differently. Sorry, repeat that one more time. How are these two teams similar defensively, Virginia and Kansas State, and how are they different? Yeah. Um, you know, I think they are very similar. Um, I think they're very balanced on both sides of the ball. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, Virginia in, in terms of ball screens and uh, when they're facing ball screens is very aggressive and, uh, and they know exactly what they're doing. They step out hard. Uh, Kansas State, you know, does, a, does it a little bit differently, but, it, but it's a similar effect in that they don't let you inside of, their, of the three-point line. And, uh, you know, so we're going to have to find ways to still get in there. That's, that's what we do. You know, we kind of are who we are. And, uh, you know, we, we drive the ball and we try to get inside the defense to be able to, you know, kick the ball out or, or finish at the rim like Jairus was able to do last night. But, you know, they're, 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 they are very similar in that they're very stingy in, in, in the half court. Um, you know, I think offensively they're, they're a little bit different. I think that's where the major differences ha are, are between the two teams. Back of the room. Hey, Coach, Brendan Meyer, Charlotte Observer. I know you said you're trying to get your guys to turn the page, but uh, Roy Williams was in here earlier and said if it was him, he would have had to scream at some point last night just to <laughs> sort of acknowledge that it had all happened. Uh, <laughs> what, what was your night like last night? Did you ever have any sort of release? And, and how are you trying to get the guys to turn the next page and, and really focus in? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, it's a tremendous moment, you know, for basketball in general, tremendous moment for UMBC. We have a great university, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited for our kids to be in this moment, but I'm so excited for, I'm equally excited for UMBC. And, uh, you know, we've got a great institution, we have great leadership, you know, starting from Dr. Robowski to my AD who's sitting in the room here, Tim Hall, uh, there's so many great people. And, uh, you know, for, for UMBC to be able to tell its own story now uh, across the world is really, really exciting for me. Um, what was your other question? Yeah, keeping the kids focused. Well, I mean, you know, it's just, we got, we got to do what we got to do, you know, at this point. You know, we're going to turn the page to, to Kansas State, and that's just what we're going to do. <laughs> Second row. Hey, Ryan, Gene Wong, Washington Post. Some of the Virginia players were saying last night that the way you defended them reminded them in some ways of what Virginia Tech th did to them in their only ACC loss of the season. Was that part of the preparation footage of, of that? And if so, what did you take from that? Yeah, I watched, you know, say their last five or six ACC games plus the, uh, you know, the, the conference tournament. Um, you know, we, we felt like, you know, our only chance was to pressure their guards. You know, their guard, we had to outplay their guards in order to have a chance. And then we had to hold our own inside. And, uh, you know, we felt like if we allowed them, the guy, whoever had the ball up top, you know, to just direct – you know, like a, uh, I would equate it to like a quarterback. You know, if you don't put any pressure on the quarterback, well, then he's going to see wherever he needs to see. 
and a uh, guy comes open on the wing, oh, he can make the pass. So our focus, you know, was totally on disrupt the ball handler up top, uh, disrupt their timing, and, uh, you know, that was kind of our focus throughout. And, uh, you know, I thought it put us in position. Our guys were, were tremendously tough getting through screens. I mean, they set a ton of screens, and, and they're really hard to, to guard, and they tire you out, you know, with the, that screening. And, uh, you know, I thought our guys just, you know, played really, really tough. And uh, the rebounding was, was critical for us. Back of the room aisle. Ryan, Jonathan Jones with Sports Illustrated. A bit of an offbeat question, but uh, you had mentioned UMBC and kind of getting your brand out there worldwide and certainly nationwide. In the niche community of chess, you guys have been known for a really long time. I'm <laughs> curious, when did you become familiar with the schools, with the program history, with chess and, and that niche community and have you had any overlap at all in the past two years yeah they won a national championship so we're, we're obviously equally proud of them you know as we are of you know winning this game um and that's the great thing about umbc you know everybody cheers for one another uh across campus you know there's so many different things going on on campus that um you know it creates a great environment you know to learn in and uh, a lot of great mentors none better than our president you know his relationship with Jarris is you know he, he's the best president you know in the country and uh you know I've, I've been fortunate that i've been around you know a lot of different places and uh you know he's to be as active as he is and uh within our teams and not just men's basketball it's it's all the teams um, you know, is really, really special. And, uh, and it's not just the, obviously, athletics. I mean, he's so, I mean, STEM is huge, and, and uh, he's, you know, they're, they're patterning programs, copying programs that UMBC is doing uh, across the country. Upsets in the tournament, it's a life-changing, career-changing type of moment. Have you had a sense in the last 18 hours how maybe – how your life is going to change going forward based on what happened last night? No, I mean, I, I'm just totally focused right now on, on our team, you know, and, and where we're at in this moment. I mean, this is such a special moment. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm so excited for them to be able to play, uh, you know, for an opportunity to go to the Sweet 16. I mean, that's, that's mind-boggling to me. So, I mean, I, I'm just going to do my best, you know, to help coach them and, and uh, mentor them through this, and, and hopefully we'll put our best foot forward and have a chance. Short left, second row. Uh, Ryan Black. Uh, first off, you have a great first name, which I appreciate. There you go. Yep. Uh, but my question is, I mean, it's obvious that, you know, all the casual viewers who turn in tomorrow, uh, who tune in tomorrow's game on TV are going to be cheering for you. But how much does it mean to you just knowing that there are going to be pretty much anyone in here that's not wearing K-State colors who maybe have only heard about you in the last 48 hours that are going to be on your side the whole time? Yeah, I mean, that's huge. You know, I, I think, you know, Jairus mentioned it last night. He was, he was so excited about, you know, all the UMBC folks that had traveled down here for the game. And we had a, we had a pretty big contingent here. And uh, to hear them cheering for our guys, and, and uh, it gave them a lot of energy. And, uh, you know, that's what, that's what March Madness is all about. And, uh, you know, we're just happy that we're a part of it. Front row left. Ryan, I'm Wyatt Thompson with Kansas State Radio. Yes. I've had the pleasure of meeting your father. And when this conversation started, you talked about not coaching with him. Yeah. But I am curious as to, even though you didn't, what you've learned the most about the game from your dad. Yeah, um, certainly just to be passionate and, you know, to be all for these kids. And, uh, you know, that's what he did, you know, his entire career, you know, it was never about him. You know, his, his focus was totally on his players and, and helping them become the best that they could be and uh, both on and off the court. And, you know, that's, that's why I do this. And, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate that I'm able to do it at UMBC with these tremendous kids. Front row. Coach, the challenge of preparing for Kansas State when most of their film has Dean Wade on it as a traditional big four, and now they're having to play small without him. How much does that change them offensively and defensively? Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't, you know, watched them a ton, you know, with, with him at this point. But, um, yeah, I think it, it definitely changes. Uh, you know, they're certainly very athletic when they play that smaller lineup. Um, their ability to get inside of the defense, you know, worries me. Um, you know, their, their, their athleticism, their bodies, you know, against our guards. And uh, we're going to have to do a tremendous job uh, of, of trying to keep them out of the paint. Our big guys are going to have to really fight. Uh, 
they're very opportunistic in transition. So when their 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 defense is really going and they're knocking balls loose, they're excellent. You know, at finishing. You know, ahead. Um, I watched the Kansas game. You know, this morning, and and that was a knockdown. You know, drag out closer than the final score indicated. You know, at the end there, but um, you know, uh, we're excited for the opportunity. Follow up. As a follow up to that. Dean Wade's a first-team All-Big 12 guy, but in some strange way, losing him, does that make them pair better against you now that they're four guards, very similar to what you do? We'll see. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, I think, you know, certainly bigger guys can sometimes struggle against us. I mean, I think that's what you're saying there uh, in terms of spacing and having to guard the line. Um, you know, but, you know, it's 40 minutes. You know, you got to play it. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks.